Hello, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds, January 16th, 2014. Today, we're lucky to welcome Jay Randall Curtis, um, professor in the Department of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. He was a graduate of John Hopkins Medical School and then did his residency, Master's of Public Health, Chief Residency, and Pulmonary and Critical Care Fellowship here at the University of Washington. He has, uh, currently holds professorship in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care, as well as the director of the uh, UW Center of Excellence for Primary Care and um, the uh, A. Bruce Armstrong American Lung Association Endowed Chair in Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine. Does a lot of research and is um, focused on the area of improving the quality of communication at the end of life. A lot of this incorporates both the uh, teaching of and study of residents. And so many of us in the room here have been uh, trained under him, both in his work as an attending in the intensive care unit at Harborview, but also in his, in his clinical research. So please welcome me in joining J. Randall Curtis to deliver his talk, Measuring and Improving Communication about Palliative and End-of-Life Care. Mike, it's a, a pleasure to be here uh, giving grand rounds at my own institution. Uh, I give grand rounds at other institutions and always wear a suit, so I thought today I would wear a suit here, too. People in my division probably haven't seen me in a suit before, but there you have it. Okay, so um, I don't have any financial conflicts of interest to disclose. I do want to uh, uh, tip my hat to the funding organizations that have funded much of the work that I'm going to talk about today specifically the National Institute of Nursing Research, which is the institute within the NIH that has really taken a major leading role in funding palliative and end-of-life care research. And then more recently, PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, that are funding a new study that I'm going to touch on uh, in terms of future directions. Research is a team sport. Uh, anyone who does research knows it's a team sport. Uh, this is a part of the team. Uh, that has worked with me, and this team has really been outstanding, and really uh, I credit all of my success with uh, the support that I've gotten from them. Um, I was thinking on the way in here, I like to think of myself as a quarterback uh, of this team. I think, in fact, I'm probably more of the mascot, um, <laughs> but uh, it's been an honor to work with this group of people. So what I'd like to do is today is ask the question of whether we're getting better uh, at communication about palliative and end-of-life care, what the data are around that. I'm going to focus a little bit on how we measure quality. How do we know if we're doing a good job? Because if we want to improve the way we do it, we have to know how to measure it. Ask the question of whether interventions can make a difference. Is this a, a learned skill, or is this something you either have or you don't have, you're, you're born with? Uh, and then I will wind up talking about this recent randomized controlled trial, improving clinician communication study, uh, published in JAMA last month, and for which uh, many people in the audience may have been uh, human subjects. So one of the points I want to make is uh, about the definitions of palliative care and end-of-life care. And I, I, I suspect I'm preaching to the choir here, but I think we really have to have very clear messaging about this. I believe that one of the major advances in palliative care in the last 10 years has been to not equate palliative care with end-of-life care. End-of-life care is an important and critical part of palliative care, but it's only a part. Palliative care is much broader. It's care focused on improving communication about goals of care uh, and maximizing comfort and quality of life for patients with serious illness and their families. End-of-life care, care focused on those who are actively dying or thinking about the kind of care you want when you're actively dying, is a key piece. Uh, but if we equate those two and we only provide palliative care when we recognize patients as actively dying. We miss enormous opportunities to improve care for patients and their families. I also want to make this definitional point, which I think has been very helpful in our thinking about this area, and that is distinguishing primary palliative care from specialty palliative care. Primary palliative care is that care provided by all clinicians who care for patients with serious illness. Specialty palliative care is provided by those with uh, specialty palliative care training and, and, and uh, interdisciplinary uh, specialists, including physicians, nurses, social workers, spiritual care providers, and others. 
I believe we need to improve both of these. Uh, we cannot rely on palliative care specialists to provide all palliative care for many reasons. One is that it there will never be enough, but more importantly, it's not the right way to do this. Many patients and families want to talk with their doctors, their nurses, about uh, issues around goals of care uh, that shouldn't all be subsumed by somebody else. The other thing is that I believe, based on my experience, the more we train all clinicians in primary palliative care, the more we're going to need specialty palliative care. A little counterintuitive, but I really believe that having a good understanding of primary palliative care allows you to understand and recognize unmet palliative care needs, meet some of those, but recognize when specialty referral would be helpful. So here's a patient talking to a doctor. The doctor says, there's no easy way I can tell you this, so I'm sending you to someone who can. That's not going to work. Palliative care got a huge boost uh, with this paper, specialty palliative care. This was a paper published in New England Journal in 2010, done by Jennifer Temmel and her colleagues at the Massachusetts General Hospital, an unfunded study, randomized controlled trial, ran out of their own resources, randomizing patients with uh, an early diagnosis of metastatic non-small Lungs, non-small cell lung cancer to either early proactive palliative care in the outpatient setting or routine care. Their results were impressive. Early palliative care improved quality of life. This is just the measure of quality of life that they used. Significant improvement with early palliative care. Early palliative care reduced symptoms. This shows you symptoms of depression as measured by the HADS-D and the PHQ-9 both significantly reduced, anxiety reduced, but not significantly in this, in this uh, sample. But what came as a surprise to everybody, including the investigators, was that early palliative care was actually associated with prolonged survival. Those who got randomized to early palliative care lived longer than those who got standard oncological care at a pretty good institution, Massachusetts General Hospital. I uh, heard... Tony Bach present these data and say that if this were a drug and if it were presented at an ASCO meeting, in the back of the room, all the traders would be on their phone buying stock. We don't have stock that you can buy in palliative care that I'm aware of, although actually, now that I think about it, I should work on that. Um, <laughs> but really, a, a, an interesting result. You might ask, why? Uh, and I think we don't really know, although we do know that patients who got randomized to early palliative care received less chemotherapy in the last week of life. And that's the most plausible explanation uh, in my mind. And then Tony actually worked with Jennifer Temple and her colleagues to try to unpack what is palliative care? What did these palliative care uh, providers or specialists do? And so what they did was a content analysis of a random sample of palliative care notes that were written on the, for the patients in the intervention arm. And they randomly selected 20 from the intervention arm in the randomized control trial, and then did a content analysis to say, okay, what do they, at least what do they document that they did? And they, they fell out into seven key elements. And these are the elements here. And I think I show this to make the point that six of these seven are really about communication, that, that really the palliative care intervention in this context was about communication. Um, relationship and rapport building, addressing coping, establishing illness understanding, discussing cancer treatments, end of life planning, and engaging family members were six of the seven key uh, domains. Um, addressing symptoms was an important domain. I don't mean to minimize that, but just to say that a lot of what this palliative care intervention is about is about communication. Another randomized trial that I thought I like to point to that I think uh, highlights the value of communication when well done was this randomized trial of advanced care planning amongst a little over 300 elderly hospitalized patients, all patients over age 80 in an acute care hospital. This was done in Australia. Randomized to advanced care planning done by a trained facilitator versus usual care. In the group randomized to the intervention, 81% received advanced care planning and 56% completed in advanced directives. They used a standardized format for advanced care planning called respecting patient choices, very well designed and well developed, although proprietary. The advanced care planning was done by this person.
person, the specialist trained to do advanced care planning, but importantly, it was done in collaboration with the patient's physician. And also importantly, the families were present most of the time, 72% of the time. These sessions took a median of 60 minutes. So you can see why they were done in collaboration with the physician, but not necessarily by the physician. Most hospital physicians don't have 60 minutes to devote to these kinds of conversations. These are the outcomes. Uh, the proportion who died in the ICU in the, in the intervention group was zero compared to 14% in the control group. They looked at PTSD, depression, uh, and anxiety in family members, and that was significantly reduced in the intervention group. They looked at family members' ratings of their satisfaction with death and their satisfaction with care, uh, also, also significantly better uh, whoops, in, the, um, in the intervention group. So uh, a second randomized trial showing that a specialist, now this is really talking, I would argue, talking about specialty palliative care of sorts, somebody trained specifically in this, having these con conversations can really make a big difference uh, for patients and their families. So how are we doing nationally? Is this, is this something we're getting better at? These are data that were published by Joan Tino and her colleagues in JAMA early in 2013, where they looked at changes in end-of-life care for Medicare beneficiaries across the US. And if you look at the blue line, they did see a significant increase in the use of hospice uh, at the end of life or at the time of death, increasing from 20% to 40%, uh, doubling. Um, but a, a portion of that increase was taken up by, by patients who were seen by hospice in only the last three days of life, far too short a time for hospice to really make a difference. They looked at the, uh, in the orange there, the proportion of patients who spent time in the acute care setting the last 90 days, that increased over this uh, decade, uh, and the proportion that spent time in the ICU in the last 30 days increased over this decade. So we are using more hospice, but we're also seeing increased intensity of care at the end of life, an increasing number of transitions from settings of care, ICU, acute care, uh, home settings. Uh, and we know that we do particularly poorly often uh, with those transitions. So real sort of issues that, that in our healthcare system that we have to address. Uh, Bill Allenbach, when he was a pulmonary critical care fellow here, did this uh, project with uh, a group of us looking again at Medicare data and asking the question of what proportion of deaths are preceded by CPR. This looked at 1992 to 2004, a time when there was discussion about advanced directives and advanced care planning, and yet we saw an increase in the proportion of deaths preceded by CPR, increasing for patients of all race, but increasing at a steeper rate for patients uh, from uh, uh, non-white races. So we are seeing, despite uh, focus in this area, increasing intensity of care, suggesting that we have a real need for improving our ability to talk with patients and families about the kind of care that they want at the end of life. So with that as a little bit of background, let's talk about how we measure quality. If we want to make this better, how do we, how do we measure it and, and know that? Here's a doctor talking to a, a family member saying, if it's any consolation, toward the end, he was as high as a kite. Uh, maybe good symptom control, but not so good communication. Uh, not sitting down, you know, using terms like high as a kite, uh, <laughs> not ideal. So how do, we, how do we measure communication? How, how can we do that? And, and there are, I would argue there you can sort of think of the ways to do that in a couple of categories. We can audio tape or videotape communication and have that assessed by experts uh, or by quantitative scoring tools to look to see whether elements of communication are there. Uh, and I think that this is a very useful way of, of measuring communication, but very time intensive. And I'll show you some of the some of studies done that have used that. We can also look at trying to measure the patient experience or understanding either through surveys uh, or semi-structured interviews with them uh, after a communication event or after an experience with a clinician. And our thinking was that that was a much more scalable way of measuring quality uh, if we were going to try to implement interventions on a large scale. And so we were interested in developing survey tools that would allow patients and families to tell us what they thought uh, about the communication from their clinicians. This was a study done uh, in the last century, I've never said that before, that's a little scary, um, where we uh, looked at identifying from the patients and families' perspectives uh, what they thought was important about physician skill at end-of-life care, 
uh, had patients with a number of life-limiting illnesses, family members, as well as clinicians in this study. And through this study, developed a conceptual model for what patients and families told us were important and had five domains, communication skills, cognitive skills, affective skills, um, enacting patient-centered values, and then having patient-centered systems. And I'm going to focus on, on communication skills. We took that information uh, and used that to develop a survey that we call the QOC, or the Quality of Communication Score. 13 items that were frequently mentioned by uh, these patients, and then took those and tested them in a, in a couple of different settings, one in hospice, one in patients, outpatients with oxygen-dependent COPD, and found that this scale factored into two subscales that had good convergent uh, uh, and discriminant validity, and I'll show you a little bit of those data. Uh, and the subscales were, the first one was a general communication, had six items, things like how good is this clinician at listening to the things you say, and then there's an end-of-life scale with seven items focusing more specifically on communication about palliative end-of-life care, how good is this doctor at talking about what things might be like when you get sicker or if you get sicker. These scales were internally consistent. They, they, tend, they can be combined together into a single score uh, as well as a total score overall. This shows some of the construct validity data. Uh, we, we don't have a gold standard, and so we measured it against things that we thought it should correlate with. Uh, the patient's overall rating of communication correlated highly with the general scale, a little less so with end-of-life scale. The overall rating of care, uh, same thing, correlating uh, more highly with the general scale than the end-of-life scale. The number of end-of-life discussions that clinician had had with that patient, uh, correlating with both, but now more highly with the end-of-life scale. And then the patient's perspective on whether the, the physician knew their end-of-life care preferences, uh, and again, uh, correlating with both, but higher with end-of-life scale. So this, this gave us at least some evidence of validity. Uh, and reliability and encouraged us to move forward using this as an outcome measure. Bob Dixon, when he was here as a fellow, was interested in looking at these data and specifically in looking at whether there was a correlation between residents' self-assessment of their communication and the, with a patient and patients' uh, assessment of that resident's communication. Uh, and he found data like this. <laughs> Absolutely no correlation whatsoever. Uh, there's some poor chap at the bottom there who has a pretty good sense, but uh, uh, really not, not good, not good. And, and uh, Bob did a great job with this. Uh, and in the first draft of the discussion, Bob wrote, self-assessment is useless. And I said, whoa, 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 wait, wait. Self-assessment doesn't predict patient assessment. I think we can say that. I'm not sure self-assessment is useless. And I think, in fact, it may be a helpful tool for us to understand uh, how to use. But I think we don't really know how to use it. And I think that trials that only look at self-assessment to see whether communication skills or other skills have improved uh, are going to be missing uh, a big piece of the picture. We also worked with uh, colleagues in, in South Carolina on, with this data uh, to look specifically at whether there was an association between trainee assessment and patient assessment when you focused in on communication about religion and spirituality. And this is a complex path analysis that I'd explain in detail, but I don't really have time uh, and barely understand. Um, but... Um, but I do want to highlight one thing in particular, which is if you look at the very bottom, when you focus specifically uh, on the issue of how good does the trainee do at talking about religion and spirituality, there is a, a, high, a significant and high correlation between trainee self-assessment and patient ratings. And I think that this is interesting both in terms of religion and spirituality, but, but also in terms of the measurement concept in general, that, that it may be that these global constructs like how good are you at communicating or communicating about palliative end-of-life care are too broad. Uh, and it may be that we really have to target in on specific things if we want uh, reliable and valid ratings. We were also interested in looking at barriers to communication about end-of-life care uh, and did a study uh, starting with patients with advanced COPD. Uh, and this was a study where patients were, had a FEV1 of less than a liter and were oxygen dependent. Only a third reported they talked about end-of-life care with their physician. 
Uh, and they identified a number of barriers, 15 different barriers to talking about end-of-life care. And one of the things I found interesting was that many of these barriers were very patient-specific. There were only two barriers that, prov- that applied to more than 50% of patients. We also identified barriers from the phys- physician's perspective, uh, seven different barriers, and only one uh, applied to more than 50% of physician- physicians. So it got me thinking that maybe there is, uh, that if we can understand patient-specific or dyad-specific barriers to talking about palliative life care, that may allow us to advance uh, this and to have these conversations happen more regularly. Three most common patient-endorsed barriers. Uh, I'd rather concentrate on staying alive and talk about death, some, re- some sort of significant resistance to talking about this topic. I'm not sure which physician will be taking care of me uh, if I get very sick, uh, one of the phenomenon of our modern medical system, uh, and, uh, and at least from the perspective of patients, a barrier to talking about palliative and end-of-life care. And then I don't know what kind of care I want if I get very sick, so, I, so there's really no point in talking about it. Each of these barriers, I think, are challenging to overcome. On the other hand, I think there are, if we know which barrier applies to a specific patient, there may be specific ways that we can address that. So let's talk a little bit about whether interventions can make a difference. Is this something you can teach people? Can they get better? And I think the answer to that is clearly yes. This was an early study in this area done by Leslie Fallowfield and her colleagues. They did a randomized controlled trial in the UK Uh, enrolling 160 oncologists and randomizing them in a factorial design to one of four arms. They were randomized to either a skills-building course with practice with uh, simulated patients or to written feedback that was based on expert review of videotapes of them talking to their patients and providing them uh, doctor-specific tips, both the course and the feedback or neither. The outcomes were assessed by videotaping these oncologists with six to ten patients three months after uh, the intervention or or control time period. And what they found was the skills building course improved the use of focus and open questions, uh, expression of empathy, and appropriate responses to patient cues. Interestingly, the feedback didn't have any effect whatsoever. And then Tony Bach has really uh, done a number of different studies leading, taking that idea of using simulation to train communication skills, bringing it to the U.S. Uh, Tony and his colleagues started with uh, oncology fellows, developing a course that they called OncoTalk. Uh, This was a publication of a before-after study. This course was done as a four-day residential workshop. They uh, brought all the oncology fellows together in, in the Rockies. Uh, and had a four-day course with simulated patients, uh, teaching them communication skills. At the time of publication, they had 115 fellows from 62 institutions. That number has, I think, more than doubled by now. And then for this evaluation, they evaluated these oncology fellows before and after the workshop uh, using standardized patient stations uh, and having those uh, audio taped and then scored, uh, looking specifically for whether they acquired skills that they were taught around delivering bad news and talking about transitions to palliative care. And what they found is that on average, oncologists, oncology fellows learned uh, a little more than five new uh, delivering bad news skills and, and, and more than four transition to palliative care skills. And I'll show you some of those data. But one example is here. The job of the, of the oncology fellow during the standardized patient visit was to tell this patient that they had cancer before the workshop, only 16% used the word cancer uh, when, when giving that uh, diagnosis. And afterwards, they got it up to 54%. Uh, really significant improvement, although still uh, room for improvement. These are the um, bad news communication skills and the proportion of oncology fellows who didn't, have, didn't demonstrate the skill prior to the workshop did demonstrate it after assessing the patient's perception, requesting permission to give the news, using the word cancer, being silent 10 seconds after the news, making an empathic statement after the news, asking for the patient's reaction to the news, and then summarizes uh, with a follow-up plan. Really sort of basic skills uh, that many of these oncology fellows didn't have going in, but uh, for most of these, more than half of them acquired it uh, after. Another uh, randomized trial that we uh, conducted in the Seattle area was led by David O., to improve communication skills. 
now focuses on this idea of identifying the patient-specific barriers. So this was a cluster randomized trial of 96 clinicians uh, at the Seattle uh, uh, VA uh, and uh, over uh, 376 patients with COPD. The intervention was to identify these patient-specific barriers and facilitators, identify patient-specific preferences for talking about palliative end-of-life care, and then feeding that information back to the patient, the family, and the clinician, and also providing the clinicians with some specific tips about how to overcome those barriers. Uh, the intervention was associated with uh, increased communication about end-of-life care at a target clinic visit. Uh, it went up almost threefold. Uh, although 11% uh, in the control group and 30% in the intervention, still uh, a lot of times this discussion wasn't had. We also saw an increase in our quality of communication score. Uh, the baseline scores were poor. Uh, the intervention increased it by six points, which was a, a small to moderate Cohen effect size. So suggesting at least some value of this idea, of this approach, uh, but perhaps we need to strengthen the intervention. So I want to talk a little bit about the recent randomized controlled trial, this study uh, uh, we did uh, here, uh, as well as the Medical University of, of uh, South Carolina. How many people in the audience were residents participating uh, in the study uh, for this? Okay, so a few, not too many. Many may have moved on. How many people were faculty asked to fill out one of these irritating surveys? Uh, okay, a few more of those. This was uh, uh, a study done, uh, published in uh, JAMA uh, last month. Uh, the list of authors are there. You'll see a lot of familiar names and faculty from the University of Washington as well as the Medical University of, of South Carolina. It was really quite an endeavor to pull this off, uh, and I think a lot of credit goes to the faculty who participated in it. It was a five-year randomized controlled trial funded by NINR. We specifically wanted to make these sessions interdisciplinary, and we included internal medicine residents as well as subspecialty fellows and, and nurse practitioner students. And each session was taught by two faculty that included both a physician uh, and a nurse. And a part of what we talked about uh, and taught was around interdisciplinary communication. We had the two sites here in South Carolina, and it, it consisted, the intervention consisted of eight half-day sessions. So for residents, it was during a clinic block, two half-days a week. There were, uh, they all started with a little uh, uh, interactive seminar, brief uh, sort of di didactic with discussion, but the bulk of the course was this communication skills practice with simulated patients. Uh, and the simulated patients uh, uh, were um, people that we drew from the Seattle and South Carolina area, <clears throat> really a marvelous group of people who stuck with us throughout the entire study. Um, they played the role of two patients, one with colon cancer, metastatic colon cancer, another with end-stage COPD. And then each of the eight sessions, the story would progress. And so the first session would be about building rapport. Uh, then we'd talk about, uh, we'd talk about code status and um, uh, goals of care. Uh, and the patient would get sicker when we talk about transitions to palliative care. And ultimately, uh, the patient, one of the patients died. Uh, the other wound up very sick and in the ICU. And we sort of talked about issues around that. The way we evaluated the randomized trial was through a series of process and outcome measures. For process measures, we used the same method Tony had used before of having those who were randomized to the intervention see a standardized patient um, uh, before uh, the intervention and then a different standardized patient after the intervention. There were two, and they were randomized as to which they did before and which they did after. We also used this trainee self-assessment, uh, which I've told you is problematic as a proxy for patient evaluations, but still, I think, interesting. In terms of outcome measures, we, we actually surveyed patients and families who are cared for by the residents in both the intervention group and the control group. So we uh, went through medical records to find notes written by residents who were in one of the two groups, uh, either in the primary care clinic setting or in the inpatient setting on patient, where they were likely to see patients uh, with serious uh, uh, illness. We identified those patients. We sent them a survey with a picture of the resident saying, do you recognize this person? Do you know this person well enough to be able to evaluate their communication skills? The primary outcome was the quality communication score, 
We also assessed quality of end of life care with another score uh, scale. We assessed health status uh, and depressive symptoms. We enrolled a total of 406 trainees uh, across both sites, 352 physicians with a 58% participation rate. We enrolled 54 nurse practitioner students with a 21% participation rate. It was a lot harder to enroll nurse practitioner students. For the residents, this was a choice between going to another clinic or doing this. For the nurse, which you know, a lot of people signed up for, um, for the nurse practitioner students, we tried to have them, we, we, we got them uh, credit for the course, but it turns out that they didn't really need extra credits. They had busy lives. It was much harder to get them to enroll in the study. We uh, sent out over 1,800 patient surveys uh, to uh, over 1,700 patients uh, and had a response rate of uh, 58%. Uh, sorry, this is what we got back. Uh, uh, over uh, 900 family surveys representing about 900 family members with a response rate of, of 73%. I think, uh, I think this response rate of 58% is a little low for uh, studies in general, but for studies of patients with serious illness like this, Actually, that was pretty good, and we were happy with the uh, uh, family response rate as well. Uh, over, uh, sent out over 2,700 clinician surveys representing 890 clinicians. Some clinicians did more than one. Some clinicians did more than 10. I think the max was like 25 or something, and I, I owe that person a, a beer. Um, and then we had uh, a response rate of 56% from clinicians. So this is the process evaluation now. This is the standardized patient evaluations. 145 trainees randomized to the intervention and completed both pre- and post-SP uh, evaluations. These SP evaluations were trained by coders who were blinded to whether it was pre- versus post, uh, and a group at uh, uh, Duke did this for us uh, using a standardized scoring method that was focused on the skills that we were teaching. So we were using... Uh, uh, a, a mnemonic, the SPIKES protocol for giving bad news. Uh, six skills there. We found that the residents improved on uh, four of the six. For responding to emotion, we were using a mnemonic called the NURSE uh, uh, protocol. And, we, and of the five uh, elements there, we found the residents significantly improved on four out of the five. These are data uh, showing in red the proportion of uh, residents who demonstrated this skill prior to the workshop, blue after the workshop, uh, assessing the patient's perceptions, invitation to give bad news, empathy after the news, uh, state support throughout the process, and exploring patients' emotions. And you can see residents did acquire these skills, at least as assessed by standardized patients before and after uh, this. And this was led by uh, Ali Bays, who was a, a resident at the time she worked with us. We looked at self-assessed competency as well, uh, looking at residents' assessment of their ability to express empathy, discuss DNR, discuss religion, elicit patients' goals, and address conflict. We did see that the intervention was associated with a significant improvement uh, in resident self-assessment compared to the control group that, got, that received usual education. Again, hard to know what that means. Um, we actually had this data, these data, uh, in the JAMA paper, and the JAMA editors asked us to take it out uh, because they didn't think self-competency warranted uh, the space in the, uh, in the, in the article. Um, I'm not sure I agree, but that wasn't an option they gave me. <laughs> um, this is, uh, this is, these are the data looking at uh, patient and family outcomes. Uh, so the quality of communication score and the quality of end-of-life scores did not significantly change with the intervention. There was... No significant change. Depression changed after the intervention, but it went up. So the depression scores on the patients were a little bit higher uh, after, uh, in the group randomized to the intervention after the intervention compared to usual education. This uh, increase of 2.2 of two points on the PHQ-9 is below the minimally clinically important difference. So it's not a, it's, it, at least by that standard, it's not a clinically important level of depression, but we did see a significant in, increase in depressive symptoms. For family outcomes, we found no change in the quality of communication, quality of end-of-life care, uh, or in uh, depression scores. Also, no difference in, in functional status in either group. 
We did some subgroup analyses to try to understand the data better. These are post hoc subgroup analyses. Uh, and we looked only at outpatients, thinking that the inpatient environment is, is, is hectic, it's confusing, there's a lot of doctors running around, it's hard to keep track of people. Uh, that didn't help us, though. We didn't see any change with outpatients. We also looked at only at patients who rated their, their health as poor, and they were asked to rate their health as poor, fair, good, very good, or excellent. For the subgroup who rated their health as poor, the intervention was associated with an increase in the quality of communication score as assessed by patients. We looked at years of training. Interns compared to others had lower patient quality communication scores and quality of end of life scores, and also higher patient depression scores. <laughs> I'm just reporting the results. <laughs> Here's the post hoc analysis for those patients who self reported. Uh, actually, first for outpatients only, no difference with the intervention, and then for those who self reported their health status as poor we did see a significant uh, increase, improvement in quality of communication. So um, I'll say that you know, this is a negative randomized trial. Um, that's what I say when I'm on tape. Um, it is a negative randomized trial. But I also believe that this may be a signal. And it may be that one of the things that we need to do is to figure out better which patients are going to be best able to measure what it is that we're asking them to measure. So I think that this may give us some direction for future studies. The, uh, the conclusions of the randomized trial, the intervention improves trainee skills as assessed by standardized patients in a before-after evaluation. It improved their self-assessment, but there were no improvement in patient ratings. Um, and there may be a number of reasons why. I don't, I don't know the right answer, but I'm, I'm very interested in, in thinking about whether, in fact, untrained or unprompted patients asked these very sort of general questions uh, may not be sensitive raters. And maybe what we need to do is to provide prompting, provide uh, training, help people with, what, with knowing what to expect to, if we want them to be able to uh, provide good ratings. Um, I also think that, that it is true that care in our system is provided by many clinicians and it may be hard for patients and families to sort of parse out and rate uh, an individual. I think the slight increase in, in depressive symptoms are interesting. It's hard to know what to make out of that. Um, it, it, it's one outcome. Uh, maybe it's a spurious finding. Um, it also may be that activating, that, well, it may be that having discussions about prognosis and the seriousness of one's illness does increase feelings of sadness. And I think there are some other data in other settings where that may be true. This may not be a bad thing uh, as long as we understand it and are able to help people through it. Uh, it may actually help with uh, understanding one's own illness and making decisions about what treatments one wants. The effect was more prominent in R1s, and that does make me wonder whether we need to be a little more thoughtful about who's having these discussions and how much training they've had uh, should more of these discussions be supervised uh, than they are now? Um, maybe we should think about some of these discussions uh, more under the model that we think about procedures, that we don't send someone off to do a central line until they've uh, done some training, uh, been supervised, and been signed off. And it may be that some of these discussions we need to think about uh, in, a, in, a, in a way similar to that. So where do we go from here? Um, I think one area, particularly around research, is to improve our outcome measures. Uh, and I, I'm, I think we may need to do that by focusing patients and families on discrete events. If we're interested in communication, focusing them on discrete communication events and providing them some prompts, some help in knowing what to expect and, and helping them to do a, a better job of rating whether this person is meeting their needs. I think in terms of the communication interventions, you know, this was, a, this was a wonderful course. We got a lot of positive feedback from residents. Uh, they really enjoyed it. It was very faculty intensive. Um, and, you know, when, when we wrote this grant at the beginning, I had a fantasy that the residency office, when we were done, would say, this is so great, we can't let it stop. We're going we're gonna to financially support it. We're going to pay for the actors and actresses. We're going to pay for faculty time. Um, I don't, Ken's not here. Ken did not say that. Um, <laughs> And, 
And I, I do think there is an important place for these kinds of courses, but I think to expect the residency program to be able to put them on in this format, I think, is a lot. Um, I think we rather instead need to think about how we integrate our communication training into our routine educational practices. Um, we're uh, interested in starting a project that's going to be led by one of the uh, current residents, Kate Whitaker, of using the ICU family conference as uh, using the sort of the procedure model for that and sort of developing a, a Tony is developing a training video, um, having people uh, be supervised for two of these family conferences with a checklist that the faculty would go through to help provide feedback uh, and see whether we can, in fact, implement that kind of approach for these events. I also think that there may be some opportunities to improve and develop innovative point of care tools that may help improve uh, communication. I think this is a this is an exciting area in education in general, and I think it's an area that we need to think about in terms of training for communication skills. The uh, the study that I showed you that David O led using the patient feedback and forms is 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 a point of care tool of sorts. And in fact, right now we are just launching a randomized trial of a um, what I hope will be an improved intervention using that same model randomizing outpatients within UW Medicine uh, who have serious illness to intervention or control. The intervention will be to obtain patient preferences for communication about palliative and end-of-life care and about goals of care, as well as barriers and facilitators to communicating, and then feeding that back to physicians as well as patients and their families and clinical, uh, clinic staff, nurses and others who may be able to support patients uh, in having these discussions. This is hard to read, but this is our current draft of the form that would go to the patient. Uh, that We're calling it a jumpstart uh, form. And it has a little information about talking to your doctor about medical care, uh, asking a couple of important questions, acknowledging that this can be difficult and people may feel nervous uh, about it, and then feeding back what they told us about whether they had had a discussion about end-of-life care, whether they wanted to, uh, whether they're... Uh, whether their preference was to focus on extending life as long as possible or focus on quality of life, uh, and then uh, whether they told us they would want CPR if needed in their current health or if they got much sicker. And then this is a similar form that would go to the, the doctor, uh, giving the same kind of information, also highlighting the patient-specific barriers and giving some suggestions about how to overcome those, those barriers. Another uh, point of care tool I want to highlight that, that Tony has developed is something called uh, Vital Talk, and you can actually download this onto your phone through the, I did it through the iPhone uh, app store, uh, and this is a, a tool to teach people how to have uh, difficult discussions, uh, give them feedback and debrief about them. This is the menu page where you uh, can uh, click on one of these five options, get ready, uh, understand, inform, deepen or equip. If you click on uh, get ready, uh, you get this page where it gives you a little bit of basic information. You can also watch a brief video clip, two minute video clip, uh, watching an expert do this. Uh, and then there's also an option to debrief after the, after the fact. And I think, I think this is an example of the kinds of point of care tools that I think we, we may need to move to, not to replace other kinds of education, but rather to supplement it. So I just want to finish up by talking a little bit briefly about the UW Palliative Care Center of Excellence. Uh, Tony and I actually talked about it in the fall, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we developed this uh, center and launched it in uh, uh, fall of uh, 2012. The mission is to improve palliative care received by patients with serious illness and their families and to provide support to clinicians who are giving this care. We really want to do that through research, education, and uh, improving clinical care. So we want to develop new knowledge uh, and educational and clinical resources, uh, focusing on UW Medicine, but also other institutions in the region, uh, and then through research and education nationally and, and globally. This is our uh, website uh, where you can uh, see events that we have going on. You can also sign up on the website to become a member and to be kept a, sort of up to speed on activities of the center and things that are going on uh, there. So in summary, then, what I've uh, tried to cover over the last uh, 45 minutes or so is to focus on uh, uh, 
measuring and improving communication, specifically about palliative and end-of-life care. And I think the measurement uh, continues to be challenging. I think we've made some progress, uh, but I do think we have significant improvements to make. I think it's clear from the data that interventions can make a difference. We can clearly teach people to do this better. But, it, but I think that you can summarize the data by saying it really requires uh, in-depth skills practice, that this is a skill like driving a car, putting in a central line. You can't learn this in the lecture hall. You can't learn this exclusively by uh, reading what people have written about it. You really need the opportunity to practice it uh, and to get feedback. And I think we need to find innovative ways to do that throughout the continuum from first year medical school through to uh, continuing medical education. I think that documenting patient level outcomes uh, is really challenging, uh, but we're interested in whether uh, these, uh, whether we might be able to provide some patient training and prompting. And part of the jumpstart form, what we're going to be doing with that form is not just encouraging a discussion, but also getting patients to realize the kinds of things that they might expect uh, their doctor to talk about. And I think for the future, we really need innovations in the way that we do this. And we need to find ways to make sure we integrate this into our usual uh, routine educational practices and ultimately cl clinical practices. And with that, I'll stop and thank you very much for your attention.